Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Well, we know that we've been talking about worship for the last several weeks. We've seen instructions in regard to the construction of the tabernacle, the various materials that God demands that are used in its construction, and also we've seen instructions concerning the priests, and not just that they are to serve the Lord in a unique way, and not that just they're from one tribe, the tribe of Levites, and from a specific household, the household of Aaron, Aaron and his sons. But also we've seen that, that the high priest, that he has special garments, and also the regular priest, the sons of Aaron, that the priest would also have an attire according to the instruction, according to the commandments of God. And tonight, we're going to begin Exodus chapter 29, a new chapter. We're going to deal with the first half of this chapter, and we're going to see Moses officiating and basically sanctifying the priests, bringing about their inauguration for service unto God. And I hope you see that these two words are closely related. The word for service and the word for worship. Sometimes in Hebrew, that word avodah, which is simply translated work, but it can mean service, a specific type of work, and that work which is related to worship. As the word avodah can mean just that, in a general sense, worship. And God has spent so many verses. We have spent so many weeks simply talking about the preparation for tabernacle worship. And we see a fundamental principle. Now, this is all happening when the children of Israel are still at Mount Sinai. And we're going to see that, that the issue has not concluded yet. They're there. And we think of the giving of the Ten Commandments and also the giving of, in a broader sense, the laws, the commandments of God. But all of this comes within the context of worship. And it's going to be a God-instructed worship that is going to allow the people to move from Mount Sinai and travel in that midbar, in that wilderness, in order that they arrive at the proper location. And we're going to see that it's because of what we talked about in our call to worship, that they did not prepare their heart in order to seek the Lord, that caused them to lack faith, meaning that that worship did not impact them properly because their thoughts, their preparation, their actions, their worship was not such that it brought about the desired change. And when I say desired change, I'm talking about the change that God desired in them, that they would see things from his perspective and be able to enter into the land. But because they did not, they took that journey, that 40-year journey in the wilderness. And even though God used it, had they been faithful, had they worshiped him properly, they would have been transformed in order that their journey into the land would have been much quicker. They would have had efficiency in their life in regard to the purposes of God. And that's something that we should understand. I want to repeat myself and say that it is worship. Proper worship, 
spirit-led worship, worship that's rooted in the instruction of God, that brings about a change in our life whereby our life becomes more efficient. And instead of wandering, instead of wasting time and enduring things that God did not want us to endure, we will go through these things rather than having efficiency through worship to achieve the things of God and to be positioned in the will of God. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus chapter 29 as we deal with the first half of this chapter in the inauguration, the sanctification of the priest for service. Look with me to verse 1. Exodus 29 and verse 1. devar, And this is the thing or the word or the matter. Now, the word devar is a very general term, but it's speaking about, in this case, something specific, and that is sanctifying the priests for work, for their service, in order that worship, that the people might be able to worship God in the way that God instructed, in the way that God demands for the outcome, the purposes that God wants fulfilled. So we read here, and this is the thing which you shall do to them, and them are the priests. And Moses is supposed to sanctify them in order that they be prepared to serve. So in this passage, throughout this entire chapter, even though that we're going to only look at the first half, It's all about positioning the priests in a state whereby they will be able to serve God. So this is the thing which you shall do to them to sanctify them, le kahen li. Now, kahen comes from the Hebrew word kohen, which is priests. But in this case, and we've talked about it, le kahen is to serve, to minister unto me and this underscores and i think so much of of worship today violates this biblical point and that is worship is unto him it is unto the lord that we might serve that we might minister unto him and it's not because god lacks something because he's missing something it is for us to demonstrate faithfulness to him. Read on in the second part of verse 1. Moses, in order to inaugurate this, this priesthood, he is supposed to take one bull from the herd. It says Ben Bakar, that is a, a son of the herd, and also two rams. And then the last word in verse 1 is the word Timimim. Timimim means that which is perfect. Now I realize that some Bibles will say without blemish, but it doesn't say without blemish. Obviously, they have to be without blemish, but it says perfect. And that word perfect has to do with a fulfillment of what we might say is the end. And when I say end, it's the goal. It's the purpose. So one bull from the the herd and also two rams that are are perfect. And what else? He says in verse 2, lechem matzot. Now, many of you know the word matzot. We're talking about matzah. And that is in regard to that which is unleavened. Realize something. And I believe I've mentioned this a few times. The temple area had bread, but the bread there was unleavened. And that unleavened bread was in a variety of different uh, forms. We're going to see here, look again at verse 2. There's going to be lechem matzot, unleavened bread, but there's also going to be not just matzah 
in the normal way of thinking, but also chalot matzot. Here again, if you come from a, a Jewish background, you're probably familiar with a special bread, which is, is partaken of on the Shabbat called challah. And this is the same word. It's in the plural chalot. And this challah is not the bread that we get on Shabbat because this challah has to be without any chametz, without any yeast or leavening agents. So it's unleavened challah, and it's mixed with oil. And the third type of, of matzah, this unleavened bread, the third form is a, a type of wafer that's also unleavened. And it is anointed, some might say it's soaked in oil. And this matzah, whether we're talking about the lechem or the chala or the wafers, the rikikim, it is of wheat flour that you should make them. Making them are these three forms of unleavened bread, the wafer, the chala, and the normal unleavened bread. From wheat flour, you shall make them. Verse 3. And you shall set them upon one basket. Now, one of the things we're going to see here is that the number one appears frequently. And the word one in Hebrew is the word echad. And from the word echad, we get the word achdut, which is unity. And worship has that unifying purpose to it. So many times the word one is repeated to emphasize unity. Again, and you shall set them, these three types of, of unleavened bread, the three forms of it, you shall set them upon one basket, and you shall bring them, cause them to come near, meaning to God, to that tent of meeting, you shall bring them near in this basket, this one basket, and also with that, you should bring with them the bull and the two rams. Verse 4. And Aaron and his sons, you shall draw near, bring near to the, the door of the tent of meeting. And look at the end of, of verse, verse 4. We had the phrase, Ve'rachatzta otam be'mayim. Now, some would say, and you shall wash them. But this washing is not a scrubbing. Most commentators would, would agree that they were already very clean. This washing is not for cleansiness. This washing is really more of an immersion. And it simply goes along with other places this word is used for speaking about immersion in what's known as a mikveh. So immersing them in preparation for worship. And this immersion has to do with a change of status where that which is common is set apart for a purpose. And that's what Moses is doing. He's sanctifying, he's setting them apart for purpose to lead worship. Verse 5. And you should take the clothes these priestly garments, and you shall dress Aaron with the tunic and with the robe of the ephod and with the ephod and the breastplate. And you shall, and what's interesting is that you are to gird him, but this word for girding is the same word that the word ephod comes from. And this teaches us that the ephod, a vest, but it's more of a girdle. Remember I said that one of its purposes, things were attached to it, united with it, was to hold everything in purpose. And this ephod, this vest, it is of a, a work that requires intelligence. That's what it says at the end of verse 5. Now, verse 6. And you shall set mitznefet, the, the turban. And this word, ha mitznefet, has to do 
with the headdress that is specifically for the high priest. So you shall set the mitznefet upon his head and you shall place the holy nezer. Now, nezer comes from a word which means to, to be set apart. We all know about the Nazarite vow that's mentioned in the book of, of Numbers, for example. Numbers chapter 6. Now, there we know that it's for a purpose. And in that same way, they are being set apart for a purpose, for serving. But again, what's emphasized here is that Nezer, which we talked about last week, and we use the word tzitz, it's referring to the headplate that had written upon it, holy unto the Lord, kadosh le'adonai. So it's this Peace that he's speaking about that is holy has a sanctifying purpose which is upon the mitznefet upon the turban only the priest's turban verse 7 and you shall take the oil this is the anointing oil and you shall pour it upon his head and you shall anoint him and his sons you shall draw near and you shall place upon them you shall dress them with the tunic and look at verse 9 and you shall gird them with the sash Aaron and his sons and you shall place upon them this is specifically to Aaron's sons the regular priests because we're dealing with their head covering and their headdress is not a mitznefet but it's a migbaot which is something different. It's more of a cap or a hat, not a turban. Now, something I want to point out is, if you go back to the end of verse 5, I said that you shall gird Aaron. And that word for girding, remember, has to do with that vest to hold things in place. But when we deal with the priestly garments, not the high priest garments, but the Priestly garments, they don't have an ephod. They have a tunic, more of a, a cloak. And we read here that you are supposed to gird, but it's a different word. You gird them with the sash. The sash is kind of a, a belt that is tied. So you, you gird them, you belt them with the sash. Aaron and his sons. And then it says you place, you, you put the caps upon them, that is the priests, and they shall be for me for a priesthood. And this is for servants, for those who are called to be priests, and this is a chukat olam, and eternal is how usually it's, it's translated. But I've feared with you many times, this has to do with a, a kingly, or excuse me, a kingdom implication. And then he says, look at the end of verse 9. Umeleta yad haron v'yad banaf. This is that you fill the hand, and we talked about this last week, that uh, you grant them authority. You, you put them in their place. You cause them to fulfill their, their calling, their role. And this also has a, and we'll see it at the end of our study tonight in verse 22, that, that you cause them to have this authority to fill their role. And this has to do with inaugurating them as priests, setting them in order, setting things in fullness for the service of God. Now verse 10. And you shall offer up the bull before the tent of the meeting. And how do you do that? Well, this word offer can also mean cause to come near. So bring near the bull before the tent of the meeting and Aaron, he places his hand. And not just him, but also his sons. They placed their hands upon the head 
of the bull. And now look at verse 11. This has to do with the offering, the sacrificing of this bull. But many Bibles I saw simply says, and, and he shall kill. It's not the world, word kill. It's the word for, for slaughter. And it's very important because killing has one connotation to it, to end life. But this word, shechita, has a different purpose. It's a ritualistic slaughter. It's that which must be done that causes no pain to the animal in order that the blood be, be received. So look at what it says in verse 11. And you shall slaughter in a ritualistic meaning in certain terms in a precise methodology. You shall slaughter the bull before the Lord at the door of the tent of the meeting. Verse 12. And you shall take from the blood of the bull and you shall set it upon, and all of this is this inauguration, this sanctifying, preparing, preparing the tabernacle and the priesthood for worship. Verse 12, you shall take from the blood of the bull and you shall set it upon the horns of the altar with your finger. And this would be to place, to make contact with that horns, the horns of the altar with your finger stained with blood upon the horns of the altar with your finger. And all the blood you shall, shall pour out at the foundation of the, the altar. So with your finger, you place it upon the horns of the altar, those four horns that we talked about several weeks ago. And with the blood, all the blood that remains, what do you do? He says here very carefully, with the blood that remains, all the blood, tishpoch, that you shall pour out, not throwing it, not sprinkling it, but you shall pour it out upon the foundation of the altar. Verse 23. And you shall take all of the flat. Now, the fat here is the word chalev, and it's the fat that covered the inter organs of this bull and also the appendix of its liver. This is the additional organs that it's attached to the liver and also the two kidneys and also the fat which is upon them these different organs and you shall burn them at the altar now the word here for burning is the same word for offering an incense now it's significant because it's not just burning them but it's for the smoke to rise up unto the Lord. That's why the word hiktarta is used here. Verse 14. And the flesh of the bull and the skin or the hide of it and also its waist. So the bull you are to take after you receive its blood. You take its flesh, its skin, its hide, and its waste, and you shall burn with fire outside the camp. And this burning of the flesh and its waste, all of this is a chatat hu, which means it is for a sin offering. Now, this should stand out, because what that does, and nearly all the commentators emphasize this, that it's this burning up of the bull outside, and this is important, outside the camp, that provided a sin atonement. And what comes into my mind is what we read in the book of Hebrews, where Messiah suffered outside the camp. And that we go outside the camp to be with him, to unite with him. It's a testimony. And it foreshadows the rejection of those who belong to Messiah. So it's very important that this is done all within the context 
of a sin offering. Verse 15. Now we deal with the ram. And the ram, that one ram, now remember, we're spoken of earlier of the two rams that were perfect. Now we take, look at verse 15, we take one of them. That word echad appears again. We take one ram and once more Aaron and his sons place their hands upon the head of the ram. Now, there's a change, not in vocabulary, but in grammar. When we dealt with the bull, even though it says Aaron and his sons placed their hands upon the head, the word for placing, meaning setting the hands, was singular. But now we see it's plural. So they set their hands upon the head of the ram. And look at verse 16, the same word that we saw in verse 11 for this ritualistic slaughter. And I use the word ritualistic meaning it does kill that bull and it kills this, this ram, but the purpose is not death. The purpose is blood. And we're told later on in the book of Leviticus that life is in that blood. We're just told about a sin offering. And the purpose is that this sin offering would mediate life to those who are spiritually dead. So one gives it life in order that we might have life. Look again at verse 16. And the term ritualistic means part of the tabernacle service or the temple service later on, that they were done. All of this was done with specific instructions. That's what ritualistic meaning, for a purpose, based upon instructions at a specific location. So you shall slaughter the ram, and you shall take its blood, and we have a different word. This is a word for lizrok, which is to throw. Now, I mentioned a few weeks ago, and we'll see this later on. There are a few different words for dealing with the blood. One is a word for placing the blood. We saw that. Placing with your finger the blood upon the horn of the altar, literally the four horns of the altar. We see and we will see the term for sprinkling the blood later on towards the end of our study. But this is the word lizrok, and it means to throw. It's a very uh, lavish term in the sense of casting something. It's not specific. It's a very broad word. So look at what he says here, middle of verse 16. And you shall throw meaning the blood, upon the altar, around, meaning all around. And the ram you shall, shall set for pieces. Now, this is the word that we get uh, a surgeon from, a different form, surgery or a surgeon. So it's a word for cutting, but in a very specific manner. And when you cut, you have pieces. So you cut for its pieces and you wash its inner portions and its legs and you set its pieces with its head. And all of this is put together. It's surgically cut up, but then it's put together and to do what with? Look at verse 18. Once more, hiktarta, that you burn, but it's a word for burning like an incense. And the emphasis is it's not the incense offering. We'll talk about that in a week or so to come. But it has to do with the smoke rising up. Not an incense smoke from besamim, these spices, but rather from the flesh. But still the smoke goes up. And notice what it says. And you shall burn up all the ram upon the altar, and it is an ola, a, a burnt offering. That's what the word ola means. Everything is consumed, and it is unto the Lord 
reach nikoach, which means a pleasing fragrance. Now, some of the commentators say that it's not the fragrance, but rather the word here for fragrance is related to the word, it's the word reach, which is related to the word ruach, which is spirit, which is probably related to the, the smoke going up. And it's this offering, this smoke offering that is pleasing, that is, is acceptable unto the Lord. It's also ishe ladonai hu. Now, it's very important that we pay attention and we know Hebrew well because it's the word ishe. And I've heard people read from the Torah, mainly in America, that may not be as as acquainted with Hebrew as Israelis. And this word, ishe, can, it's written the same word, way, as the word woman. So we need to be clear that we don't say the word isha, but ishe, because this is a fire offering, and it's from the word esh. Esh is the word fire, so it's a fire offering unto the Lord. It is. And that last phrase, who, meaning it is, it makes it emphatic. It emphasizes this, verse 19. All of this is preparation. Remember how we began our worship tonight. He did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. All of this is necessary preparation for what Moses is doing. All of this is about sanctifying the priest, but this is preparation for their sanctification. Look now to verse 19. And you shall take the Ayil Hashini, the second ram. And once again, we go back to the earlier verb, which is singular. And Moses has set his hands, also his sons, their hands, upon the head of the ram. And once more, here's the third time, and you shall slaughter. This word specifically, according to instructions. It's not just killing for the sake of killing. There's a purpose for it. It's part of a a precise ritual at the tabernacle, and then we have something similar in the temple, so that you richly slaughter this this ram and you take from its blood and you shall set it upon. Now notice this ram has a different purpose. You take from its blood and you put it upon the earlobe of Aaron and upon the earlobe of the sons, his sons. And notice it says the right earlobe. So this blood of the second ram, it's slaughtered in the exact way, but the blood is dealt with differently. It's not for sanctifying the altar or any other reason. It is for sanctifying the priests, Aaron and his sons. And I want to read this section because three things were told about this blood. You place it upon the right earlobe, and then we're told upon the thumb of their hand, and what thumb? The right thumb, and also upon the toe, and this is the big toe of the right foot, their right foot, and he says, notice once more, ve-zarakta, and, and this would probably be the remaining blood, it says, upon the altar all around you throw the blood, the blood that was not placed upon the earlobe or upon the thumb or upon the big toe of their right foot. The remaining blood you cast, you throw. And this is just that. You throw it in a very lavish way upon the altar, Saviv, all around. Verse 21. And you shall take from the blood which is upon the altar. So important, I highlighted that. We take the blood that specifically was thrown upon the altar. Altar, a place of sacrifice. And we're going to see that this has 
a sanctifying influence. Unless you experience this sacrifice from the altar, you cannot be set apart for the purpose of God. You can't serve him. This is a message to the priests, and it's also a message for us. If we don't have the blood of our great high priest, Messiah, we're not set apart to serve him. Verse, verse 21, and you shall take from the blood which is upon the altar and from the oil, the anointing oil, and here we have a different word. We have the word vehizeta. This word is a word for sprinkling. The first word, lizrok, is for casting, throwing it in a very broad sense. But this is sprinkling it in a much more precise manner. So you shall, and it's all speaking to Moses, he's doing everything. You shall sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his son, sons that are with him. So they are all being sanctified at the same time with this blood and also with this anointing oil, his sons and him together with him. Look at the end of verse 21. And sanctify him and his garments and his sons and the garments of his sons. And this is the second time it says with him. Now this phrase, ito, is emphatic with him because they serve together. They have a common purpose, and it all relates to worship. So they're being sanctified to worship God in behalf and in collaboration with the children of Israel. Now look at verse 22, our last verse tonight. And you shall take from the fat of the ram and the tail. And this is the, the fatty portion of the tail. The word here is the word alia. And this is a word that uh, every time I've come across it in a synagogue, when I hear the reading of the Torah, I always wonder, what, what it, does it literally mean? It's not a word that we use too much today. And it speaks about the fatty portion of a tail of this, this ram. And we also see that we take its fat, which covered the inner organs and also the appendix of the liver and the two kidneys and also the fat which were upon all of these organs and also, notice, the right leg. This is the word shok. There's some, some conversations about what portion, many would say the, the thigh, the upper portion of the leg. We'll come back to this at a different time, but let's just translate it very broadly. On the right leg, you take the right leg, and all of this, and the word right is being emphasized. This is the fourth time. And it says, for the ram, and then we have miluim hu. Now, miluim is a word for fullness. There's a debate between Rashi and the vast majority of other commentators. We have this word. This is not the first time we've encountered it. It's the second or third. And it has to do with inaugurating a service, putting the priest into action. But Rashi... He says here he wants to emphasize the, the base meaning of this word, malay, miluim, but it comes from the word malay, which is fullness. And he's saying that all of this, what we're talking about, if we go back up to verse 22, you should take from this ram the fatty portion and also the fatty portion of the tail and its inner organs, and also the appendix of its liver and its kidneys, 
and it's fat which is upon these organs and also its right foot. He sees this as a peace offering. Now, peace is in the sense of completion. And instead of using the normal word for peace, shalom, he uses the word malay, which simply teaches us that peace is about fulfilling the will of God. So all of this is being done to fulfill this inauguration of the priests. Now, I want us to realize something, and this is a, a preview for next week. We need to remember when we go back to the first part of chapter 29, not only are you talked, spoken of, Moses is told to take one bull from the herd, and two rams, but remember, I emphasize these, these unleavened bread. Whether they be unleavened bread as in matzah or unleavened bread as in challah, which is without yeast, a special type of challah that was used in the temple and the tabernacle, or whether these wafers, we haven't dealt with that yet. So the service is not completed. We're going to complete it next week when we begin in verse 23. But let me conclude with these words, and that is how specific the instructions were for Moses to do, to put things in order that they might be prepared for worship. We haven't completed it. We've seen week after week specific instructions concerning the tabernacle, the priestly garments, how to construct them, how to place them upon the priests, how to put them in the proper place, their measurements, all of these things, very specific, in order that worship would be done right. And that means based upon the will of God, the desire of God, the instructions of God, so that it mediates a new life and the outcome is not death. Well, again, I'll close with that until next week. May God bless each of us, and may you experience the fullness of the will of God in your life because you obey fully the word of God. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.